uh, an intellectual flight, so is any flight, electronic devices are not allowed. If you want to use your electronic device, you can do it outside. Okay? We give you paper. We are destroying the Amazonic forest for that, but the paper is already there. Please use it. Mark your questions. You can use your laptops outside of this room. So, uh, it's again a pleasure to have Pasquale Serpico teaching these uh, new classes. Pasquale uh, got um, his undergraduate degree from the University of Naples, a factory of uh, brilliant minds, some time ago. Yeah. Then PhD, uh, Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich, in Germany, München. Uh, then he went for a postdoc at Fermilab, and then he was absorbed by the French CERN first. CERN, CERN first, and then he was absorbed by French CNRS in annecy levier not far away from CERN, but on the right side of the border. So it's a pleasure to have him here. And uh... is this working? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here after, I think, three years. Um, I was asked to cover the subject of high energy physics processes in, uh, in, uh, in this context, namely uh, the transport of cosmic rays and accelerated particles uh, in the media of our interests, which are the galaxy and the extragalactic space. And uh, um, just a, 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 an information which will be useful for you I plan to do everything on Blackboard, and uh, I also wrote some notes that will be available daily after the lectures. So don't stress too much in taking down the notes. If you miss one line, it won't be dramatic. You will find them back on the notes, uh, available hopefully one hour or two after, after the lecture. Uh, I also prepared some exercises that will be clearly uh, um, uh, identified as such in the notes with some bold face blue character. I will briefly introduce them uh, during the class if I have time. Uh, and they are not very difficult, at least I think they are not very difficult. Um, they are more um, the type of exercise that um, are useful for you to, to, to realize if you have understood what was said or not during the, uh, the lecture and to familiarize with some concepts which are not necessarily familiar uh, to you. Uh, this is the other difficulty I had. So uh, you come from very different places uh, all over the, the continent and probably have different uh, backgrounds. So, uh, and I think there is also somebody from outside this continent. Uh, um, yes, so, um, so I'm not sure uh, what you know, what you don't know. Um, this is why the lecture will be probably mixed. There will be some topics which are elementary uh, and some topics which are maybe too advanced for some of you. I try to go for a compromise and so that everybody can profit a little bit from these lectures. Um, and before starting, um, let me uh, sketch the plan of these lectures. Maybe I start, I put the plan here. Uh, I will start today uh, with some introduction. So this introduction is about units, convention that I will use, uh, some generalities on the environments like the galaxy and extragalactic space, and uh, I will uh, uh, give you a first um, sketch or a, a model of the, the kind of diffusive uh, propagation um, Professor Blasi just mentioned uh, before, this is not a realistic model, but it's probably what some of you have already seen, I don't know, in, a, in a statistical mechanics or other courses. Uh, and then in two, which probably we start covering at the end of today's lecture, um, uh, I will move to the diffusive cosmic ray uh, propagation. Okay? Uh, again, here in this stage, I will go gradually. First, recall a few notions of the movement of a particle in a constant field, then give an heuristic idea why you should expect then once you add some uh, uh, turbulence, some fluctuations in this field, uh, 
charged particles, relativistic charged particles in particular, uh, should move diffusively. Um, then I will give, I don't know if at the end of today or beginning of tomorrow, lecture and more um, formal uh, description of that. Uh, even if you cannot follow the details, that would be useful because it, you know it's something that you will find in books, etc. So you can make the link to what you find in books and uh, explain later uh, how this generalizes when uh, uh, when you add a further complication, the fact that scattering centers are, 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 are moving actually in your frame. Um, and then um, it's clear that this is not the whole story as uh, uh, you heard from the previous lecture. Particles do not only evolve uh, in, uh, in configuration space, in the three-dimensional space, they also evolve in energy space. Okay, so there are energy loss processes which are very important for both diagnostic purposes and for knowing the energy spectra that were shown in the, in the previous plots and figures. Um, so I will move to the description of the uh, two body particle-particle um, -particle interactions which are responsible for the main uh, channels uh, of uh, energy losses. So uh, I will give some generalities on relativistic two-body interactions. Um, probably most of you, if not all of you, know about that, but just to set the stage. And then describe uh, a few very important processes. So synchrotron radiation. This was mentioned already today. Uh, inverse Compton, okay, um, then I will cover some leptonic interaction with matter very briefly because this is not the main subject of uh, really high energy uh, astrophysics, it's more intermediate energies uh, that will be more of interest for some, for example, for X-ray, um, X-ray astrophysics. So I will just go briefly with that. Then there is a. Sorry, what did I do? I put the high on the wrong side. Then adronic interactions. This is a big chapter because it also includes all the processes you have been, uh, that were sketched just before. So the processes of uh, energy losses uh, uh, concerning ultra energy cosmic rays, all these adiabatic, beta Heitler, uh, photopion productions, and the GZK uh, related effect. Uh, inelastic proton-proton collisions. And then uh, I will spend some time showing you some basic information on the, on the neutrino uh, spectra coming from pion production and the photon spectra coming from pi zero uh, uh, decay. Uh, so basically this sets the stage for, for what you would need um, uh, for, uh, for other lectures on the uh, neutrino and the energy gamma ray uh, of adronic origin. And then we will come back, like in a circle, we will come back eight uh, with the diffusion, diffusion loss equation, where now we have integrated the loss term on the top of the diffusive term that are, are treated today and tomorrow. And uh, uh, we will see some uh, uh, basic analytical uh, solution to this equation for specific cases, one of which will be um, the, the, the secondary over primary ratio mentioned before, uh, which is used for the diagnostics on, on the, on the um, parameters of diffusive propagation of cosmic rays in the galaxy. Uh, I will give you also a, a a simplified model, a proxy 
for what changes, for instance, if you want to look for, for dark matter through antiprotons, although I won't enter into that too much because this will be the, the topic of uh, some lectures next, next week. Uh, so, uh, but the, the idea is that we go back and put together all the pieces of the puzzle, okay? Um, now, something about units. How many of you are familiar with natural units? Have heard about them, at least. Okay, more or less everybody or almost everybody has heard about them, maybe not familiar in news. Um, uh, in astroparticle physics, uh, it's a strange situation. So in astroparticle physics, we share some convention uh, with particle physicists and uh, other conventions with astrophysicists. So uh, let's be clear on, uh, um, on what we do, because otherwise you are shocked uh, uh, after a few lines of what I write. So we tend to use natural units. Natural units is system, basically means where that C, speed of light, H bar, huh? reduced Planck constant, and the Boltzmann constant, these are set to one, okay? It means that we measure energy, mass, momenta, uh, inverse length, inverse time, uh, temperature, all are energies, okay? The units are energies. Um, what kind of units? Typically electron volts, and there is the subtlety. Electron volts and multiples like GeV, et cetera, are uh, unit, uh, the units preferred, just like in particle physics. However, when referring to astrophysical objects, macroscopic scales, the typical unit becomes the Herg. Okay? So, um, uh, in order for you not to be... Um, too much confused, I, I, I wrote down a little table for quick reference of these correspondences. So one second is three times 10 to the 10 centimeters, and this is 1.5 times 10 to 15 electron volts to the minus one. One joule is 10 to the seven earth, and this is 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electron volt. By the way, for your curiosity, a macroscopic unit that you find in basic physics is roughly the energy of an ultra-energy cosmic ray. Hmm? So you can think of the ultra-energy cosmic rays close to this GZK cutoff as bringing in one particle typical energy of a macroscopic object, which contains of order Avogadro uh, 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 particles. It's, it, it's amazing. Huh? And, uh, okay, the other distance of, uh, units of distance that we use very often for obvious reason is the parsec. Uh, I hope you know what a parsec is. One operational definition is 3.24, uh, if I'm not wrong, light years. Uh, but this is clearly a, an astrometric related uh, notion but one parsec is three times 10 to the 18 centimeters. And another unit that we use is the barn for cross section, which is 10 to the minus 24 centimeter square. This is shared with uh, particle physics, of course. Uh, and then for magnetic fields, uh, the Gauss is the typical unit used for astrophysical uh, purposes. By the way, have you, do you have any idea of what's the typical field strength uh, of the magnetic field of the Earth? If you take a compass, uh, what's the kind of uh, magnetic field strength that is underlying this phenomenon? Have you ever... Sorry? Yeah, something like that. So the, the right scale is is fraction of a... a, 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 a um, 500, what did you say? No, it's much bigger than that. It's 500 milli Gauss, maybe. So it's, it's roughly a Gauss, the, the right scale, okay? So, and the Gauss... Okay, it's 10 to the minus 4 uh, Tesla, which is the uh, international system unit for, for, the, for the field. And this is roughly 0.07 electron volt square. Okay? Why it's electron volt square? One simple reason why you can you can uh, get this 
is that a magnetic field square is an energy density, okay? So the square of this is electron volt to the fourth power, and the electron volt to the fourth power is an energy density, because an energy density is an electron volt over volume, but the volume is length to the minus third power, and the length to the minus third power from here is electron volt cube. Okay, this is just of practical use to, to go quickly into, into some uh, um, numerical conversions. So uh, uh, first things this afternoon, when you have some time, uh, is to do some exercises to, if you are not familiar with this, if you are familiar with, with natural units, you can skip it, but I suggest you to do this, this kind of exercise. So the first thing is uh, temperature. Compute your body temperature in uh, electron volt, assuming you're still alive. Um, then mobile phone. Compute the frequency of your mobile phone in electron volts. If you know, I hope, what's your uh, mobile phone frequency. Otherwise, you can look it after. Uh, compute your height and weight in natural units. You don't have to tell me the results. Huh? I mean, this, you can keep by yourself. Uh, and also, OK. So actually, you can compute height, weight, and uh, H. This is in electron volt. This will be in electron volts to minus 1 and the electron volts to minus 1. And then your density in electron volt to the fourth. Oh, again, this is within 10%. I hope you know roughly what's a human body density. If not, uh, jump into the sea on a swimming pool, and you will get an estimate. Um, and then um, there is, I, I told you that there is a hybrid sort of convention, the convention that is used for, for electromagnetic units in most of what I'm saying, if not all, hopefully all, is the, the Gaussian electromagnetic convention, which means that the four pi's enter into the Maxwell equation, not in Coulomb's law and Biot-Savart's law. And then the, the electric charge of the positron, which is the square root of alpha is the square root of 1 over 137 roughly at low, at low energy. And this is 0.85. So that you have a quick uh, table for numerical conversion in what I'm saying. Okay? So this has nothing to do with the subject of the lecture. It's just to set the stage of some uh, basic um, uh, uh, numerics. Okay? Now, um, how many of you have more a uh, particle physics uh, background than, than an astrophysics background? Or just to have a statistical? OK, so it's a minority, I would say. Um, but for those of you who are not familiar with these uh, systems, uh, let me sketch a few of the differences. Okay? When we talk about galactic environment or extragalactic environment, these are very, very different from laboratory environments including you know, the, the, the kind of conditions that you may find in the, in the, in the beam line of a, a collider or so. Uh, a first difference is that the density of matter is very, very low. Okay? You have very few particles per centimeter cube in the galaxy and in the extragalactic space. So it's hard for the human mind to conceive how empty these objects are. Okay? To give you some idea, the typical densities that you find in the galaxy are, are, are of the order of one particle per centimeter cube, or even below that. And uh, if you go to the extragalactic space, this drops by, by something like six orders of magnitude or so. Hmm? So these are extremely rarefied objects, okay, compared to, say, these kind of conditions where you have an Avogadro number of particles per centimeter cube of that scale. Uh, the second uh, difference concerns um, 
uh, distance scales. Okay? The distance scales we deal with are, are very, very large. So a typical distance scale in the galaxy is of the order of few kiloparsec. Huh? The distance from the Earth to the galactic center is about 8 kiloparsec. You can have an idea in meters or centimeters by uh, this conversion. Uh, typical distances to extragalactic objects are hundreds of megaparsec. Uh, so the nearest galaxy is roughly uh, Andromeda, so big galaxies, spiral galaxies, is roughly uh, one megaparsec away. Hmm? And typical objects which are maybe invoked to accelerate ultra-energy cosmic rays are typically located at hundreds of, or at least several tens of megaparsec, hundreds of megaparsec if you are below the, the GZK cutoff, and can go up to gigaparsec or more for, for, for instance, for the putative origin of the neutrino flux. Okay? Um, so we are talking about very, very large scales. So from kiloparsec for the galaxy to gigaparsec from the extragalactic sky, um, typically, instead of using distances for the extragalactic sky, people tend to use the redshift, okay? Uh, has anybody uh, heard about this concept before, the redshift? I see everybody in audience, so it's fine. Uh, for a quick conversion, at low redshifts, the distance to an object which is extragalactic is roughly 40 megaparsec times the redshift in units of 0.01, okay? Um, and then there are time scales. The, these systems evolve over very, very long time scales. You heard uh, in the previous lecture that the typical residence time of cosmic rays in the galaxies are of the order of tens of millions of years, maybe 100 million years or so. Uh, for comparison, uh, the orbit of the sun in, uh, uh, in the Milky Way uh, has a comparable length, is roughly 200 million years. Mm? And the age of the universe is 14 giga years. So we are talking about very, very long time scales. This will come back very useful in a, in, uh, at the end of this lecture because we will make some heuristic argument why you can neglect some terms with respect to others, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Another important notion is that the galactic and also ex actually the extragalactic media uh, are, are, high, are um, magnetized, okay? So uh, there is a magnetic field uh, pervading uh, the galactic environment. Uh, how we get to that conclusion has to do with observation through lots of different tools from Faraday rotation to Zeeman splitting to, to synchrotron uh, emission and so on and so forth. Uh, that's not important for, for, for the remaining of these uh, lectures. Uh, but there is a typical magnetic field strength, which is of the order of few microgauss uh, in the galaxy. In particular, uh, there is a regular field, more or less, uh, uh, um, in the plane of the galaxy, uh, related probably to the spiral arms. Uh, but you see that the strength of the galactic uh, field is roughly one millionth of the strength of the terrestrial field. Hmm? So we are talking about relatively quite small fields from, from a laboratory uh, point of view. Um, and then um, another important notion that was briefly um, sketched in uh, one picture that uh, Pasquale showed uh, is that the radio sky presents some, uh, some sort of uh, smoothness or some thickness, okay? So, uh, uh, this has to do with the fact that despite the fact that the, the galactic plane in terms of gas and stars is relatively thin, is something like 100 parsec uh, thick, uh, the magnetized part of the galaxy is relatively uh, uh, thicker. So you can think of the galaxy like, uh, uh, like Alpha Horus. Hmm? From the side... There is a thin plane, that's the Dulce de Leche, and then there is a magnetized area which is much thicker, okay? So this is maybe from one to, I don't know, 10 kiloparsec, and this is of the order maybe of 100 parsec, okay? So it's a relatively poor uh, uh, cake because there is very little Dulce de Leche and a lot of, uh, but anyway, that's, that's an idea. 
And that's the region where cosmic rays basically are propagating. It's much broader than the region containing the putative sources of these cosmic rays, which are stars and, that, and all the, the like. Also, the extragalactic sky is very likely magnetized. OK, this is a still, um, of course, this is also the, 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 the description of the magnetic field of the galaxies is an open subject of research in detail. Uh, but for the extragalactic sky, we don't really know what's the strength and the structure of the fields. However, there is indirect evidence that the extragalactic sky is magnetized. Uh, we don't know what's the strength of the magnetic field that is uh, trading the, the extragalactic sky. Lower limits are around maybe 10 to the minus 19, 18 Gauss. And upper limits are at level of 10 to the minus 9 Gauss, nano Gauss. So somehow in between these two, uh, there is a sort of structure which we imagine uh, probably tracing the filaments connecting galaxies uh, one to another. If you have seen any cosmological simulation, you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, but probably there are fields uh, also in the, uh, um, entering the cosmic voids, although very, very, uh, very small. Mm? Um, this is about magnetic fields, and that's all, uh, all we need. Um, there is also light. This is not surprising, although we all know that the universe is mostly dark. Uh, if you look at the sky, you see light. And uh, uh, these lights contribute to the, to the background that the cosmic rays will feel. Uh, in particular, in the uh, extragalactic sky, uh, there are two backgrounds of light which means photons that we have to take care of. One is the cosmic microwave background. You have heard about it, I hope. This is the, the thermal radiation. It's a black body radiation, uh, uh, almost uh, isotropic, that pervades the whole, um, the, whole, uh, the whole sky, corresponds to a black body with a temperature of roughly 2.7 Kelvin. Okay, And the energy density today is roughly point 0.3 electron volt centimeter cube, roughly a little bit below. Uh, this energy density scales quickly with redshift, okay? So earlier in the universe, this is one plus z to the fourth power higher. Huh? And the number of photons is, uh, uh, is growing with the cube of uh, one plus z. Uh, and there is another background which is of importance for uh, for cosmic rays uh, propagating over the extragalactic sky, which is the so-called EBL, uh, EBL, extragalactic background light, which is not surprising there because there are stars and galaxies all over the sky. They emit light, in particular optical, ultraviolet light, and this light contributes to a diffuse background uh, filling the whole universe. Uh, actually, there is also a, a, an important infrared background associated to the EBL, which comes mostly from reprocessed uh, uh, light into, um, into the infrared band through uh, scattering with dust. Okay? If you do cosmology, you know that dust is a very important uh, object, but uh, for us, it's only contributing to, to, to populating a lot this part into the infrared. Um, and roughly, actually, this is much, more, uh, much less abundant than the CMB, okay? The energy density in the EBL is, I think, a couple of order of magnitude below the CMB. However, since these are optical photons, ultraviolet photons, and so on, uh, there are some proce processes which are characterized by threshold. So they need targets of higher energy, uh, and they can be operational earlier on uh, in the propagation of cosmic rays. So we, we will see... Uh, uh, what I refer to in uh, probably toward the end, third or fourth lecture or so. Um, and then, okay, there is a similar contribution from stars and, uh, and uh, uh, dust in our own galaxy, okay? So besides the CMB, which is everywhere, including our own galaxy, uh, there, is, uh, there is starlight and there is uh, uh, infrared light. In our galaxy, uh, that's not true anymore. So in the extragalactic sky, you have a sort of hierarchy. So the energy density U in the CMB is much larger than energy density in the EBL. 
In our galaxy, that's not true. So the energy density in the CMB is actually lesser or equal than the energy density in starlight. Huh? And uh, uh, another important difference is that the energy density in starlight um, depends on your location in the galaxy. This you immediately realize, especially in the southern hemisphere. You look at the night sky, you see that there is lots of stars toward the inner part of the galaxy, the Milky Way, the bulge, etc. And uh, okay, some of it you don't see because there are clouds uh, and uh, there is absorption. But clearly, the night sky is not uh, uh, is not homogeneous. Okay, so towards the inner galaxy, there are more stars and there is more light. And this is probably uh, locally around the sun. The amount of energy in the CMB and starlight are comparable. If you go toward the inner galaxy, there is a, a hierarchy of a factor 10 or even 100 higher uh, starlight. Um, so, so far, so good. I think uh, this is the, 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 the only notions I, I, I need you to, to keep in mind for, for quick estimates of some processes in the following. Um, let me re, um, introduce a few notions about random, random movements. Probably you know about them, but uh, uh, it's good to set some stage. Uh, if you have a, a medium which has a finite density of a target, and there is a process, for instance, think of a photon propagating in a, uh, in a material, okay? The type of propagation that this photon will, will, uh, will experience is, is essentially described as a random motion, okay? There is a characteristic length, which we call the mean free path, over which the photon moves uh, straight. And then every now and then, uh, this will bounce against some target, an atom, for instance, of your medium, and change its direction, okay? Uh, so the characteristic length, the mean free path L, uh, has to do with the density of your medium, and with some uh, intrinsic properties, which is the cross-section. In particular, this length is 1 over the cross-section times the density of your medium. Okay? So you can think of it as the effective cross-section that the, the target presents to your photon or other particle in its propagation. And then there is a rate of interaction, um, uh, of course, so there is a typical time scale over which your photon, let's say, will go on straight and then move, changing direction, okay? And this rate, let's denote with gamma, this rate is nothing but the velocity of your particle, which I will denote beta, times uh, the density, times the cross-section. Remember that if I put C equal 1, V over C, which is typically denoted as beta, is also equal to V. And you immediately see that this is nothing but beta over L. Okay? So this is the inverse time after which your particle will have uh, interacted. Nothing so complicated. Uh, and there is also a notion of optical depth. So if you have a region, say, of size R, a sphere, homogeneous sphere of density N and size R, uh, well, there is a, a quantity called the optical depth, uh, which is nothing but the ratio of R to the mean free path. And this has to do with how many times your photon will interact in your region before, before escaping, okay? So uh, we can quickly estimate what this value is. Mm? Uh, if we have the typical distance, uh, the average distance that your photon will, will, will travel is easily seen to be zero, okay? So the distance that your, your photon is, is traveling is, is basically the, 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 the average, so it's the sum of all these vectors, hmm? the average of this thing. But you see that if I assume that the directions are random, well, basically what I'm summing over is something which is randomly directing, okay? On average, these are randomly directed, so this is zero on average. This is not true for the variance. 
this is I hope you are more or less familiar with these notions, but if not, that's a good, uh, a good time to introduce them. If I sum these, so after n steps, hmm, uh, the variance will be given. I can split this sum into a sum of Ri square plus something which is L square times basically ij of the cosinus of these two angle. And since this is random, well, yeah. So this goes to 0 for the same argument as before, but the first term remains, and this is L squared times n. OK? Because now I'm summing over n terms, each one as a typical length of L. And so this gives me L squared times uh, n. So for instance, you can ask yourself, uh, what's the typical um, um, uh, time a photon, in this case, or a generic particle, uh, requires to escape my region of optical depth tau or of size r? Okay, so you impose that your x square as a function of n is equal to r square, mm? and this will turn out to be true when L square N is equal to tau, sorry, to R square, which means that N will be equal to R square, R square, which is tau square. In general, you can generalize this to any time. So there is a correspondence between N, the number of steps of your trip, and uh, uh, the time elapsed. Huh? And in general, the time to escape, for instance, will be given by what? By the typical time it takes for a particle to do one uh, segment, which is the inverse of this by, by definition, times the number of segments that you need to go before you escape, right? So this will be given by gamma to the minus 1 times n. Hmm? This is n is tau square, so it's r square l square. 1 over gamma is l times beta. OK, so this gives you tau times r divided by beta. OK. Uh, the kind of propagation that we have here is a discrete version of what we call a diffusive motion. Uh, so you can think of it like this time scale 1 over gamma to be the, your unit of time. Uh, but it can be generalized to, a, uh, to an arbitrary time. And in general, consistent with this expression, you will have a typical variance as a function of time, which is nothing but it's the same formula, just written for a generic time and not for the escape time, gamma t, hmm? which is also equal to L beta t. Hmm? t is nothing now. I'm replacing the n coming from here with, from here, t times gamma, nothing but that. So this is the escape time if I replace with this. Generically, for any other t lower than the escape time, this will give me this expression. Okay. The only thing that you should retain from this is that the variance of the distance that your particle has traveled uh, is linear in time. Okay. This is very different from a ballistic motion where the distance is proportional to time, x equal v times t. Huh? In a diffusive motion, the square of the distance is linear in time. Okay? Uh, this proportionality con constant here, which is dimensionally the mean free path times the velocity, uh, this is related to the diffusion coefficient. It's actually the diffusion coefficient apart for a numerical constant 
that depends also on the dimensionality of the space over which you are, we will see a more exact uh, uh, version and correspondence to the cosmic ray movement later on. But for the moment, keep in mind this, uh, uh, this picture, okay? If you are diffusing back home after a, a long night, you have been drinking a lot, well, now probably you call a Uber and that's it. Uh, but if you walk back home, uh, uh, that's the kind of movement that you will uh, that you will experience, okay? And probably you can think of it like these are uh, traffic lights or poles or, or buildings. Very good. So any problem till now? Probably are I hope you are. Most of you are familiar with these notions, but if not. Uh, it was a good moment to, to introduce them because we will find these features in a more uh, realistic uh, treatment of the way cosmic rays propagate. Are there quick questions on things like that that are completely above your head? I hope not. Okay, I don't see any lost people. So I will erase something. For sure, I can erase the sketch of the lectures. So imagine you have a, a charged particle and a constant magnetic field. I throw this particle into the magnetic field. How this particle moves? What's the trajectory of this particle? I have a constant field. And I throw a particle into it. What will happen? OK, it's spiraling, OK? So uh, you have seen that, right? So if I throw it perpendicular to the field, this will just move on a circle. If I throw it with a component which is parallel to the field, this will evolve on a spiral, OK? So uh, this is still valid in a relativistic context. Huh? Probably you have seen this in classical, uh, and so, um, classical mechanics and electromagnetism. Uh, but this is still valid in a relativistic con uh, uh, context. The only difference is that uh, the equation of motion gets some gamma factor in it. So mass time gamma is going to be equal Q V cross B0. B0 is my field, this homogeneous field. And uh, uh, OK, whose direction in the following I will assume to be the Z direction, by the way. So the gamma here is the usual. 1 over square root of 1 minus beta square, OK? Uh, and actually, since the acceleration is orthogonal uh, to the velocity, it means that the modulus of velocity is preserved. This is exactly like in, uh, in non-relativistic physics, so I can bring this out. Uh, if you are not convinced, uh, OK, there is a, a little exercise proposed that can prove this to you. OK? And uh, um, immediately from this, uh, you, you, you can take the projection of this on the, on the axis of the magnetic field, the projection along z direction. This will be 0, because this vector is orthogonal to both the velocity and the magnetic field. So if I take the projection on z, this is 0. Which mean, the right-hand side is 0, which means that the, the derivative of Vz is 0. Vz is a constant. So Vz is constant, which also means that Pz is constant. This is nothing but m gamma Vz. And also uh, the, the Pz over P, which is called mu, or pitch angle, uh, is also a constant. To be more correct, this is the cosinus of the pitch angle. But yeah, that's also constant. OK, we will use this in the, uh, in the following. Uh, of course, the momentum, 
by this condition, also the momentum p orthogonal, which is the square root of p square minus the z component square. If you wish, this is the square root of px square plus py square. This is also a constant. And this is equal to uh, square root of 1 minus mu square. You will see this type of uh, 1 minus mu square, etc., appearing again and again. This is nothing but a geometric uh, a projection factor. Okay? And as you described in words, the motion is quite trivial. So uh, the motion in the z direction, we have the equation of motion here. It's just constant velocity. And the motion in the xy direction is a circular motion. So we have that dv gamma, this, the, the, this is the orthogonal projection. So xy is q over m uh, gamma, sorry. Uh, uh, B orthogonal B0. And this is also equal to V orthogonal square over R. Uh, this is a centripetal acceleration. So from this, we derive the R, which is M gamma over Q B0 times V orthogonal. This is exactly the same expression that you have derived for the so-called gyro radius of a particle spiraling in a magnetic field, apart for this factor gamma that appears in the relativistic context, OK? So uh, since these are important quantities, I will put them here. Why they are important? Because they will set some scales, which are extremely useful for our problem. So uh, um, you are familiar, I hope, with the, with the non-relativistic counterpart of this problem. And this problem is described by, uh, by the inverse of the period of rotation, omega g, uh, gyration. That's what the, the, uh, the suffix stands for, which is q b0 over m. Associated to this, there is a frequency, nu g, which is omega g over 2 pi. And this frequency for your reference, OK, of course, this is qb0 over 2 pi m. And this frequency in useful units is going to be 2.8 hertz times the, 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 if I write the charge of your particle as z times e, times z times m e over m and the, the field in micro gauss, OK? So you see that this is quite low frequency for a particle which is, say, the mass of the electron and in a field of uh, uh, micro gauss strength. Um, and then there is the, the gyro radius, which is just v orthogonal over omega g, OK? And the only difference that you have in the relativistic uh, case is that now R L is going to be gamma times R G. And another way to rewrite this is square root of 1 minus mu square times rigidity in over B0. Rigidity is momentum over charge. OK? And this is 10 to the minus 6, 1 minus mu square r in gigavolts, uh, uh, 1 over b0. So this is b0 in micro gauss parsec. This is exactly the comment uh, uh, Pasquale was doing before. So you see that this is a very, very, very small scale for particles which are gigavolt or even teravolt, etc. So basically, compared to the astrophysical scales, the kiloparsec, the megaparsec, et cetera, this is a very small scale. So your particle is gyrating on a scale which is much, much shorter than the typical scale over which, say, the distance from a typical source to us. Okay? So you can think of the particle making many, many orbits. Okay. Now, is this always true? 
one of the exercises that I, I suggest you uh, to make is to compute at which rigidity, or if you wish, at which energy, this starts to be a bad approximation. Okay? Uh, um, in particular, which energy a proton or an iron nucleus will have a gyro radius which is comparable to typical kiloparsec distances in the galaxy. Okay? And this is quite important because uh, um, one picture that Pasquale was not showing to you is the arrival direction of ultra-energy cosmic rays. And I can tell you that it looks quasi-isotropic. Okay? So I invite you to think what this calculation implies once I tell you the scaling and the fact that at 10 to 19 electron volt, the sky looks almost isotropic. And you should tell me what you learn about the origin of ultra-energy cosmic rays from these two observations. Okay, so this is, this is the uh, one exercise I propose. So after this uh, uh, quite elementary, I think, uh, uh, calculation, we are ready to write down the equation of motion for our particle. We have integrated our problem, and the result is Vx is V gamma cosinus omega t. The omega is nothing but omega g over gamma, which replaces your gyro frequency in the relativistic concept. And if you do the calculation in numbers, this will turn out to be of the order of uh, basically a uh, fraction of a radiant per second for a GeV particles, which means that uh, your frequency is ridiculously uh, 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 high. Uh, yeah, your time scale is ridiculously short compared to the time scales of propagation, okay? Um, v, Y will be V orthogonal sinus omega T, and V, Z is just a constant which we can also write V times mu, while V orthogonal is V times 1 minus mu square. Okay? So far, so good. The coordinate, sorry, X of T will be XG, the initial position, plus RL sinus omega T. Y of T will be YG, plus RL cosinus omega t, and Z of t will obviously be Zg plus V mu t. This point, X, G, Y, G, Z of t, this is, this is called the guiding center of your particle. So what does it mean on this plot? It's a point which is moving uniformly along this direction. So it's the center of this circle at any time. Hmm? Very good. This was the easy part. Now, and probably you have seen this before, uh, the, the interesting ap uh, aspect happens if I now perturb this configuration. And I will start adding a little sinusoidal a perturbation on the top of this homogeneous uh, field, okay? I will choose this uh, perturbation, uh, and I can erase probably this central part of the, of the blackboard. I will choose this uh, as orthogonal to my big field so that the XY movement is not altered, and the only thing that is altered is the movement along Z, this will turn my problem into an effectively one-dimensional problem. So this is a simplification which is very useful uh, to grasp the, the, the physics, okay? Very good. So I add a delta B orthogonal to my B0, so that you can imagine now the field as being like that. Huh? Okay. And uh, uh, the, the XY 
this delta B in modulus is much smaller than B. Huh? Very good. And then for fixing the notation, this is the coordinates. This is what I choose. The components of this field are going to be cosinus minus kz plus some random phase psi. Uh, sinus minus kz plus psi, zero. OK? Note that I chose a static field. This is not a propagating perturbation, OK? You see no time here, just the space direction, OK? We will drop this approximation. Uh, one good heuristic argument for why this is not so bad to describe the, to zero, le zero order is that you can think of the cosmic ray like moving much, much faster than the, ta the, 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 the velocity of this perturbation, OK? So by using the equation of motion that we wrote, you will end up with describing the only uh, coordinate which we assume has changed, which is the z component, OK, because of this condition, which means that d mu over dt, mu is the ratio of pz over p, so it's equivalent to vz, the third component of velocity, is going to be q square root 1 minus mu square delta b over energy times cosinus omega t cosinus minus kz plus psi minus sinus omega t sinus minus kz plus psi. And now I define some shorthand notation. So let's call this capital C, for instance. And this will be, these I can use the trigonometric identity to rewrite as a single cosine. Hmm? Cosine, I will call it cosine of W times T plus psi. And this W, however, is going to be omega minus K mu V. And C is Q square root of 1 minus mu square over energy times delta B modulus. Hmm? Now, what happens if I take the average of this quantity? The average over what? Well, the average over, over the random phases of these waves, because there won't be a single perturbation, for instance. There will be an ensemble of perturbations. If I take a random phase approximation and you average these over psi, you get zero, OK? There will be another approximation that will be done uh, in the following, which is a long time scale approximation. Namely, we are only interested on the evolution of this particle over time scales which are much, much larger than the gyro uh, period, OK? Why? I told you, these are ridiculously small scales. OK? We're talking about seconds or things like that, or 10 to the minus uh, 6 parsecs. And we are interested to evolution over 10 million years and maybe kiloparsec. So basically, we don't care about the, the short time scale movement, which is equivalent to say that we care about typical time scales which are much, much larger than 1 over this omega that I was uh, mentioning before. And of course, if you average these over time scales which are much, much larger than, than 1 over w or so, you get 0, OK? Because this is a bounded function between minus 1 and 1. And you uh, divided this uh, over a large time scale. So you get something which is bounded by 1 over a large time scale. And that's basically 0, OK? So on average, we say, keeping in mind this ensemble average of this sort that I, I explained to you, on average, d mu over dt is equal to 0. And you see now the similarity to, to the drunken path that I described before. Even there, the average displacement was going to be 0. Okay? This is not true anymore if you compute, uh, however, the delta mu square as a function of time. Hmm? So I take this. I multiply by dt. 
and I integrate over a finite amount of time, what do I get? I get something which is c square integral dt from some arbitrary t0, sorry, dt prime to t of what? Cosinus w t prime plus psi integral dt prime, d second, sorry, t0 t of cosinus w t second plus psi. And then I use a very advanced piece of math. Don't be shocked. You have seen this a long time ago, I think. OK? So basically, I, I rewrite this product as the, the cosinus of a sum plus the cosinus of a difference. Now you see that once I have the sum, and I take the average of this guy, hmm, this behaves exactly the same way as this. So this piece, on average, goes away. However, the piece containing the difference does not go away. Why? We will rewrite it like delta mu square. OK, this will be 1 half of c square. And then you have this double integral, dt prime dt second up to t, cosinus of w t prime minus t second. So far, so good. This implies that the derivative over time of delta mu square, hmm, this comes from the definition of a function through an integral, OK, uh, is going to be c square half. And then you have uh, two pieces, in principle. You have the piece which goes as integral over t dt prime of cosinus w t prime minus t. Uh, and another piece which is integral over t dt second cosinus w t minus t second. OK? Now, these are exactly the opposite of each other. I can rewrite these as an integral minus t, t, c square, half of cosinus. Let's call it something like a w, s minus t prime. Sorry, minus t, ds. Hmm? Because you see that the argument here is just the opposite of the other. I can change a variable, and that's, that's what comes out. And now comes in, again, this approximation. Huh? So this is a little bit tricky because you see that the t argument, the time variable, enters here and enters also in the stream of integration. However, I know that whatever time I'm looking at is very, very long with respect to the typical time scale of your uh, 1 over omega. Okay? So I approximate this to c square alpha integral minus infinity to plus infinity of this function. The s. And here is the magic trick, because now I can rewrite these in terms of the exponential representation. Hmm? What can I erase? I can erase probably this part. Another very advanced piece of math is that the cosinus of x is e i x plus e minus i x divided by 2. And then I have the integral minus infinity plus infinity of something that behaves like a x i x dx, sorry, x uh, say y times dx. And this is 2 pi delta y, hmm? which means that if I replace this 
here. I, I get an important result that deserves to be put probably. Wait, before, before you erase. Yes. Yes, I think here you didn't write it, but at some point you're, you're using the, the unperturbed structure. Yes, of course. So this of course. V becomes V. V, v, v exactly. Yeah, this is simply, sorry, here, okay? So here I'm replacing the, the Z with this expression here that you see comes from here, okay? So what I'm doing here is a little bit delicate in the sense that I'm assuming that as a result of this perturbation affecting this movement, huh, the, 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 how to say? that I can apply this perturbation on the top of the unperturbed trajectory that I had computed before, okay? So this is intrinsically a perturbative uh, approach. Hmm? So it is justified as long as delta Exactly, this, this comes from this. Hmm? And as a result of all this uh, uh, mess, uh, we end up with, uh, with a f a expression pi, 1 minus mu square, omega, delta b over b, 0 squared. And then I introduce this resonant momentum. This comes from the properties of the delta, huh? where k res is just omega over mu times v. Okay, so this comes from this hmm, plus this identity. So what 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 have we discovered? Uh, basically, we have discovered that the variance of the pitch angle over time is not vanishing. It's proportional to the to the relativistic gyro uh, frequency times what? What is this piece? This piece is the amount of energy in the perturbation with respect to the baseline field. Okay? The more perturbed, the larger this variance. And then there is this resonant piece. Okay? This resonant piece uh, basically depends on this argument this thing to vanish. And uh, what does it mean physically? Uh, the best way I can show you what it means physically is to draw a picture. What it means is that if you have a particle, imagine that you have a very long wavelength perturbation with respect to your gyrating particle your particle will just surf this wave without any effect, basically. If you have a very short wavelength perturbation with respect to your gyration motion, what your particle will see is some sort of little noise, but your particle keeps gyrating because it's averaging out this noise over a single orbit already. However, if your particle is as the right Larmor radius compared to the, to the wavelength of your, of your um, perturbation, then it can move away. It, it can uh, undergo an efficient, an efficient, uh, let me draw a line like that. In this case, which is this resonant case, your particle can diffuse uh, uh, along your, your um, uh, Z direction, okay? And so there will be a finite amount of this. Um, an even more simple way to describe this phenomenon is to look at the fact that this one minus mu square is nothing but this projection effect on the orthogonal direction with respect to the field. So instead of writing the diffusive, the variance of the pitch angle, we could write directly the, the, the variance of the angle and define 
the analogous quantity, a sort of diffusion coefficient, but for the angle directly theta instead of the cosinus of theta. And as argued in the notes, I won't repeat all the steps here, this will be of the order of omega delta b over b0 square evaluated at, the, uh, at this resonant condition. And this is now valid more in general if you have an ensemble, a power spectrum, for instance, of perturbation in the field. Uh, basically, the diffusion in angular space is nothing but a, a, a multiple, actually a submultiple, of your uh, uh, fundamental frequency times the amount of power that your uh, fluctuation has at that uh, wavelength resonating with the, with the, uh, with the field, with the, with the cosmic ray. Okay? There are some numerical factors here of order one that I won't, I won't uh, bother you with. So what, that, what does it mean here? It means that basically the angle of your cosmic ray will change over a time scale which is 1 over nu, OK? And this time scale is just a factor, a few, say, larger than the typical orbiting time of your cosmic ray, the factor being much and much closer to unity the more perturbation there is at that scale, OK? Um, this is a very simplified picture of what's going on. For instance, the, motion, the, the, the propagation is not really exactly resonant. This is just the sort of dominant uh, effect uh, unless there are special conditions kicking in. But it illustrates that the movement of the cosmic ray is diffusive with this uh, 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 variance, which depends on the amount of perturbation with respect to your baseline field. And also, it's a very different type of um, uh, diffusive movement uh, with respect to what you are probably used uh, to. For instance, if I open a bottle of uh, parfum and I let some time elapse, you will start smelling uh, 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 the parfum that I was opening. This kind of diffusion is a collisional diffusion. It comes from the, the slow time, the finite time, that the molecules will take bouncing against other atoms and molecules in the air to get to your nose. This is a diffusion Against what? Against perturbation in the field. It's not hitting any particle, OK? Although you could call this quasi-particle in, 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 in some context. So it's called collisionless diffusion, OK? And this is the basic motion uh, that uh, charged particle experience in the, in the magnetic field, um, in, for instance, in the galaxy. Um, and as Pasquale was mentioning before, uh, actually, there is a empirical evidence, which is known since very long time, that this is the kind of stuff that happens in the galaxy, coming from the observation of boron, beryllium, lithium, or sub-iron sub abundances. You see that the typical time scales inferred for, the, uh, for, these ob for these elements to be produced in the right amounts in cosmic rays through spallations actually exceeds by far the ballistic time scale a cosmic ray propagates through uh, the galaxy. So it makes sense to model it in terms of a diffusive process. And we see that quite elementary considerations tell you that actually you can get relatively easily a motion of this type uh, for a charged particle, a relativistic charged particle, moving through a perturbed uh, magnetic field. Okay. So I think I can stop here for the first lecture. And uh, I don't know if there are questions or doubts, but um, uh, if you have some points which are not completely clear, but the whole picture is, uh, I invite you to have a, a look at the notes and maybe come back uh, to me after you have uh, read the notes so that uh, uh, perhaps this will show, um, how to say, uh, dissipate naturally. OK? Thank you. Nonetheless, there is some time for a few questions, if you have them now. You want to add something? Yeah. Ah. OK, this is going to be nice. No, just, just a, uh, of course, everything has been said already. But just it's interesting that uh, if you use this expression that Pasquale wrote, 
And you can ask yourself, um, you know, I put the numbers in, and then you want to ask, um, how long would it take to have a deflection of order unity of this thing? Uh, and you do it for typical parameters of the galaxy. You need this number to be of order 10 to minus 6. So the perturbations that we are asking about is a part over 10 to, thou, uh, 10 to uh, 4 or say, yeah. yeah, 10 to 3, 10 to 4. So it's tiny correction and it leads to a gigantic effect. So basically, there is almost, it's almost natural to expect that it will propagate diffusively. You have to arrange for unrealistic natural fields to not, to not to generate this kind of motion. Yeah. And again, in terms of numbers, Pasquale described this uh, um, the random uh, motion, the random interaction in the beginning of his, uh, of his uh, talk, uh, of his lecture. And again, you can ask yourself, if you use the parameters that Pasquale gave you, uh, uh, it's well, now a race. But say one particle per cc per cubic centimeter in the galaxy, and ask yourself how much would it take for diffusing on that scale, and you will easily find that it scatters the first time on Andromeda. So an effect of one part out of 10,000 on the field leads to a gigantic effect, and collisions are totally, uh, uh, totally relevant in this uh, business. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's perfectly correct. So this is another manifestation of what I told you. So the conditions in the galaxy are so different from the conditions on Earth that what is the only type basically of diffusive process that you experience in typical phenomena on Earth uh, is not going to happen at all in the in the galactic environment. On the contrary, a type of uh, um, of uh, uh, phenomenon that you have to work hard to reproduce in the labs on Earth happens, uh, happens uh, quite naturally in, in, in our galaxy. Uh, um, it's not only related to that, but actually to more broad uh, class of um, uh, programs in physics. Actually, there is a whole branch which is sort of laboratory uh, plasma astrophysics uh, where people try to emulate uh, some conditions which are very, very, very hard to, to encounter in normal life uh, and which seem to be very typical, on the contrary, of astrophysical objects. So there are many efforts uh, in, plasma, in plasma physics trying to, to, to have a laboratory counterpart of many of these uh, ideas. So I, I'm not an expert on that, but just to mention that this is a very, very active field of research. There is still time for one or two questions. Don't get intimidated. Did I intimidate people? No, I don't think it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Otherwise, we're not good. Uh, there is a one question there. You are the hero that is sending everybody to lunch. Otherwise, we would not go. Just a curiosity. Yes. How well these conditions on the laboratory simulate uh, the, the conditions? Uh, uh, okay. Okay, as I said, I'm not an expert on that. One of the key issues in a, in a practical environment in the, in the lab is that you must be sure that there are no collisional targets at a density which is disturbing your uh, whatever collisionless um, system you, you want to study. So in general, they only last for a very short time. Uh, that's what I, 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 I know. Um, so I think it's the past the last 10 years or so that this has become a sort of uh, realistic. Uh, but again, uh, what happens is that you lose your particles because they start hitting uh, impurities or residual uh, gas in your, in your system relatively fast. So this is, as far as I know, the most limiting practical uh, um, limitation of, of, of your reproduction. On the other hand, there are others. No? For instance, the high temperature could be a limitation in some cases. Uh, I don't know. The, the, the of course, you must use some rescaling because the field strengths we are talking about here are very, very uh, low. So you must have some um, rescaling uh, of, uh, of, your, of your values. But apart from that, it might be, OK, another difference might might concern the type of uh, plasma that you might want to consider. There are astrophysical situations where you have electron-positron plasmas, and this is not so cheap and easy to reproduce in a terrestrial one. So, uh, 
okay, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, but yeah, there is, there is some. Uh, One more question. We're not leaving by the time that the class is scheduled to leave, so. I can go on. You, you better ask a question. <laughs> ah, yeah. So uh, how well do we know the, the magnetic fields and the anisotropies? How do we measure? OK, very, very good question. So uh, the answer is uh, quite badly for any uh, reasonable uh, person on, on Earth working in a field different from astrophysics. On the other hand, uh, compared to other fields like the extragalactic uh, space, etc., we have some idea of what the magnetic field of the, uh, of the galaxy is on, say, kiloparsec scales. So the regular field, this B0 here, is first of all, it's not really a homogeneous field. Uh, what I'm talking about uh, homogeneity here is homogeneity on the scales of interest for these microphysics to happen. So over hundreds of parsec, it does follow, for instance, the spiral arms, the field in the disk. Um, on the top of that, there are perturbations, there are fluctuations, turbulent field uh, is typically named. Uh, the turbulent field, however, has, is turbulent on many, many scales. Okay, so the tricky part is to know the turbulence at the right scale here. Okay, so at very, very large scales, actually the delta B over B is not small. It's of order maybe one, okay, at very large scales. At low scales uh, in, um, let me get this right, in low scales in, in physical space, not in key space, uh, large key, uh, there are some informations, I think, from scintillation, from, uh, from probes of the, of the interstellar medium. Uh, and uh, some of them are, as far as I know, are consistent with this delta B over B, which is below one, well below one, but non-vanishing. Uh, actually, for phenomenological studies, this is something I will come back uh, later on. You don't really need that because in any case, uh, you are not going to describe a, a situation very close to this. You are going to describe a sort of average diffusion over something that maybe is the sum of many macroscopic domains. Each one has a regular field oriented in a certain way. So you will get a sort of isotropic average uh, 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 diffusion coefficient, uh, which is, uh, is a macroscopic object, is a phenomenological object, which is very hard to link to the microscopic, strongly anisotropic uh, diffusion uh, tensor, because it's a tensor in general. You see immediately here, uh, but one can argue uh, more in detail next lecture, that the, in this model, the diffusion along the, the, along the field line and the diffusion across the field line are very different. So it's much more efficient in one way than in the other. And so if, it, if we were, had we been in such a situation, okay, so let's say that, that we are here and this is the real configuration of the, of, 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 the, of the field, well, you know, a source here of cosmic rays, we would never see anything like that because the, 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 the time scale for, for this orthogonal propagation is, is much, much longer. So the true situation is that there are fields line connecting uh, uh, and, and turning over, over, over scales which are typically of 100 parsec. And uh, the fact that we see roughly isotropic uh, cosmic ray flux is another uh, way to infer that most likely there are many sources contributing to the cosmic ray that we see on Earth. Um, otherwise, we should see some uh, anisotropy. Okay, you, so would see an, you would see completely anisotropic here. Here, yeah, but probably you would inside. see nothing in the sense. It depends on the, the numbers. This is a sketch. But it could happen that the time scales for. Okay, there are two problems. One is to assure isotropic uh, flux, the other is to make sure that, say, the diffusion time scale from a source to you. Is, is shorter compared to, say, the lifetime of your source or the lifetime of the galaxy or what, or what not. 
So uh, this depends on, on, on what happens to the, both to the microscopic fluctuation around the regular field, but also on the shape of the regular field around you. So. Um, Do you feel like taking one last question and keep the answer within three minutes? Yeah, it depends okay. on the question. <laughs> Um, uh, the displacement of the particle uh, stuck uh, as a current produces yes. another magnetic field. Y Can it uh, be thought as a, as okay. a new perturbation? Uh, yeah, in, gen in general, cosmic rays do produce a current. Uh, and, uh, um, okay, so we will see next lecture more in detail that, um, um, okay, there is a typical current associated to the, this is the movement of a single particle, okay? Uh, first of all, there is one complication that in general you will have particles coming from many sources all over the sky. Uh, so um, in reality, there is not a single source there and, and that. So macroscopically, the current is a sort of average, first. The second thing is that there is a trend in isotropizing the cosmic rays, okay? This is basically inferred from here. What I'm saying here is that there is a rapid, relatively rapid for astrophysical scales, change of direction, okay? Now, this is a 1D approximation. You should generalize this to 3D. So overall, what happens is that even if you start with a source which injects ballistically a flow of particles away, true, there is a current, uh, but quite rapidly, uh, um, these cosmic rays won't move anymore in a coherent way at velocity uh, c, uh, but they will uh, basically reach a much lower velocity, which is of the order of the Alvan uh, velocity you will see uh, in the following. And even there, you're right, macroscopically there is a current. This current is instrumental in filling the, the, the loop that Pasquale was mentioning before. Namely, this current acts as a source, because a current in Maxwell equation is a source, right? A source term. This will act as a source of perturbations in the electromagnetic field. Hmm? So in reality, I didn't tell you where these things come from, these wavelets. And actually, cosmic rays are among the, 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 the sources of these wavelets themselves. Now we start touching the, the idea that the whole problem is nonlinear. It's coupled. So the cosmic rays, through currents, they can uh, uh, excite uh, perturbations in the electromagnetic fields. These perturbations themselves act as a, a, a target for the cosmic rays diffusing. And this whole problem is usually not treated in numerical codes, or et cetera, is still um, actually subject of actual research. So uh, trying to understand some features, how, for instance, can this be um, involved into particular shapes of the spectra of cosmic rays that we see at the Earth? This is uh, one, one uh, for instance, one research we, we worked on together. Uh, but you're right. So. I have factorized the problem. I didn't tell you where this comes from. I just argued if this is there, then this is happening. Why this is there, you will see probably next lecture or next two lectures by Pasquale, and I will use this in the next lecture to, to go a little bit further, to be a little bit more formal on these things. Probably I will answer some of your doubts, okay? <laughs> I hope I didn't disappoint you or you, uh, but uh, I try to not to spoil too much, but to give you an idea. Okay, so I think it's a good time to thank both Pasquales for the wonderful morning. <laughs> of course, it was on purpose that we asked them to give lectures at the same in the same time spot. So, uh, but. Um, we reconvene at 3 p.m. sharp for uh, Professor Muraz's class, be on time. Uh, you have a list of restaurants within a walking distance. If you walk more than 10 minutes, you're getting lost, okay? That should be within 10 minutes. And don't be diffusive. 
see you back here.